Okay, so uh, I'll uh, move uh, towards uh, Baltic, and I'll, I, 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 I wasn't planning to do this until uh, earlier this week actually, so I went to the dog, yeah. Oxnes. My Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> my colleague in Bergen, and uh, I, knew, I knew he published this, it was part of this uh, paper on, uh, on uh, the cod, herring, Sprat jellyfish competition. So I read it and I said, oh, this might be interesting for the students here. So I, and yeah, he had a presentation ready for, ready to go. So I I I, I, I borrowed that. Uh, he, so yeah, so he's been. Uh, this is really something he has been uh, for uh, fronting for a long long time uh, in 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 Bergen also, and. Of course, the, the general background here is that there is a general invasion of <coughs> jellies globally. There's more, more jellies than there used to be in uh, many places. Um, at, least some, at least that's what's claimed. And I, 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 I think we have, um, we have, this is something we've been very concerned about in the Norwegian fjords also. I mean, I'll, I'll return to that. Because there we have fjord, we have jelly fjords and fish fjords. But, but basically, again, uh, when you think about um, light as controlling marine ecosystems, you normally think about it as how it affects phytoplankton growth. Uh, that's a very trivial and obvious connection there. They eat photons uh, and produce biomass. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Just to make sure. <laughs> Uh, but there is another linkage that, and that I've been alluding to clearly already, and that's that there is an interaction between, on the process of uh, any, um, uh, the visual predators that are uh, fish eating zooplankton, you know, we've already been through that, and there is an interaction of uh, an effect of light on the, uh, any carnivores, uh, fishes, uh, or any secondary consumers in eating other fishes also. And that means that there is indirectly some sort of effect of the competition relationship between the tactile predator and the visual predator, because light also affects the success of, of these rates. That's the es essence of this, uh, this part. And we, we've looked at the, how uh, vision, uh, how light affects the feeding efficiency of fish. And uh, we, so you, you're already primed to this. And this, this is very obvious when you think of it in terms of turbidity or in terms of light absorbance. If you're familiar with the Secchi depth <coughs> measures, eh, where, you, where you lower a disc into the sea and you note what depth you can't see it anymore. <laughs> it sounds very subjective, but it isn't actually, it's quite accurate. Um, and the important things to remember when you talk about light in the ocean is that it is decaying at a constant rate with depth, which means there is an exponential decrease in the number of photons with depth. So here is a, that means that there is a, with depth there is a linear, log linear decrease in the remaining photons with depth. And that is very sensitive to small changes in that rate. So the actual, um, actually the, the actual number of photons reaching a certain depth varies a lot with changing, changes in turbidity. Okay, if you and if you have been diving, uh, you probably know. I've seen this uh, firsthand. If you go down, it gets darker. You can see colors disappearing quickly. And all that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> what does that mean for um, uh, 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 organisms? If some organism have a preference for light that is at a certain level, so it wants to remain between a uh, lower and in a particular light range, that's where it sort of likes to be. If it's too low, it can't see anything, for instance, or like the jellyfish, if it's too much light, they 
they burst. <laughs> Actually, that's true. <laughs> some of them, some of the deep water jellyfish, like the periphyla, I'll show you a picture of it. They, they don't, they explode like uh, the trolls if they're exposed to too much light. So in a clear water situation, which is here, a low turbidity system, you have a sort of a, a ra rather wide habitat range. There's a large fraction of the water column where you would like being in. Well, if you have a if you have a more turbid situation, you have the same preference for light, but you have a higher turbidity coefficient or a higher light extinction coefficient, then this habitat volume is contracted. It's much smaller. Remember this figure because I'll, I'll, this is something that enters into the Baltic <laughs> Baltic example. <laughs> So there's a, there's a change in the fraction of the habitat, the, of the water, that you actually can uh, be in. Okay. Yeah, so it's not only sort of pushing uh, your preferred habitats to the surface, but it's constraining it for the volume that you can uh, <coughs> live in. Um, when you go, we, we have, this is, these are estimates, acoustic estimates from uh, Norwegian fjords about the, the, the fish, about which gives the fish abundance. If you have a, an echo sounder and you, you cross, uh, go across a fjord, you can actually integrate and say this is how much fish there is in this fjord. And these are estimates for, for different fjords. And these are the winter, the pure water absorbance in these fjords. So this is the attenuation coefficient you measure when there is no chlorophyll in the water. So of course, an algal bloom would certainly increase the, the attenuation and the, the, the disappearance of light. But there is a sort of a background, a sort of a pure water, uh, no chlorophyll attenuation coefficient. And the difference here is really salinity. Some fjords are more coastal than others. There are, some other fjords are influenced by oceanic water, so they have a lot of uh, uh, Atlantic water in the, in, the basin water, in the basin part of the, the fjords, while others are purely, depending on the seal depth, that's essentially the difference. But here you see strong correlation between the fish abundance, then this fish abundance is that's mes mainly mesopelagic fishes. It's, the, it's fish you probably didn't know existed, but it's, uh, it's Morolicus and it's uh, I don't think they probably don't exist in the Baltic. <laughs> but these are these are, are fishes that are are always there in the fjords. They are they are local populations. They are well, they are of course influenced by by recruitment from from outside. But mainly they are uh, it's deep water scattered fish. It's probably the most they exist in all the global ocean. You find them everywhere over the over the whole earth. The mesopelagic fishes. But these are very good indicators of how, uh, how nice it is to be fish in these fields. Okay, so there's another, some other data also that things are happening in terms of fish biomass, and of course there's many explanations for what, why fish biomasses go up and down. In the Black Sea, you've had this <coughs> massive collapse of uh, many fish species, uh, and at the same time you have had an increase in in some of the jellyfishes. And uh, so the, the, the common explanation has been that the jellyfishes were introduced there and uh, they sort of outcompeted the fishes or something. That's been uh, the, the traditional hypothesis. But if you look at, at the data for the second depth data, again, you will see a, a long term trend in the second depth. And when the second depth goes, becomes smaller, that means that the water becomes more murky, huh? darkening, the ocean, ocean darkening, that's what we call it, to scare the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> ocean is getting darker, and definitely the Black Sea is getting darker. So that, this is caused by eutrophication of some uh, various kinds, and there could be many reasons for this. Um, and I, again, yeah, the, this is another way of, of just uh, plotting these data is the relationship between Seki depth uh, and um, 
and the fish, fish biomass. Huh? So the, the deeper the, the Seki goes, the clearer the water, the more fish there were in the, in the Black Sea. This is a very strong relationship. Right? It's, it's really rare. You don't often see this clear correlations in, in ecology. Really. It's, it's really a, <laughs> something you would... You would uh, and, and even more convincing, to me at least, is that uh, when, you, when you add what goes on in Norwegian fjords with what went on in the, in the Black Sea, it's, it lays right on top of each other. Possibly we're dealing with a very strong mechanism here. This is, uh, to me, it says that this, this could be something. Uh, and this is what uh, some of my first uh, cruises, we went to fjords and we, we found these uh, jellies. In a, I remember it very well. Uh, because it was, when I started, it was rather new, actually, in the early 90s. <laughs> this was, uh, there was something, something, a bit of a discovery. Find these, and you, this is not the ordinary jellyfish you, you find in summer here. This is the Periphyla Periphyla, the deep water jellyfish. It's a fantastic animal. It's a, it swims with its tentacle up in front of it, and it goes in and it digs into the sediments for finding food. And it's, it's like a, uh, it's like a fish, <laughs> except it only uses its tentacles to, to feed on, on food like that. Strong dial bird migrations, and, uh, uh, and they burst if they get into some. So they're big, they're quite large. Here is a, um, when we put out, when we were trawling in some of these fjords, you really couldn't, you had to be really careful, I mean, not to, 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 to destroy your trawl. So. So here is an example of just a few minutes of trawling with a, with a, a pelagic fish trawl in this, uh, uh, in this uh, Lurefjord, a particular one. And that's uh, Dal Oxner's uh, inspecting catch. <coughs> so, but now recently, there has been an increasing number of fjords which could be called jellyfish fjords uh, uh, or periphyla fjords. So more and more fjords are, or, are invaded or uh, you find occurrences of, of mass occurrences of, of these jellyfish. They actually exist all over the globe. There's also a very, very uh, uh, widely distributed species in the deep water, but in the oceans. But they're quite rare out there. Nothing like you find in some of the fields. Okay, yeah. So here is another um, uh, thing we see in the Norwegian coastal water. It is, uh, uh, and this is a time series going back to 1935, and it's based on uh, uh, measures of uh, seki depth and, uh, and um, water samples from, from the coastal water. And what you find in Coastal water is an increase in the absorbance of light at 500. Uh, this is a, a given wavelength, and it might not seem a lot, a lot. That, but you have, uh, but if you if you if you if you if you do actually take this, uh, um, and, and in terms of light, the amount of light that comes down through the water column. This is Lurefjorden today, and this is Lurefjorden in the 1930s. And that's quite now the, the scale isn't uh, missing the scale, but 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 this is the habitat for the fish actually, and mainly where it's feeding on most of it, much of its of its prey, and it could make a huge difference and explain sort of the disappearance of it from. Of this is the mass mesopelagic fish that I'm talking about. It's like this bigger. Um, yeah. So so this could be enough probably be enough to, to sort of generate this tipping point between the jellies and the fish in, the, in, the, in this particular field. Again, you have seen these things, but uh, here we can also, we can, we can build a similar type of model for, for a tactile predator, or like a deeply mechanistic model uh, of how efficient it is in capturing prey. Um, and compare that with, uh, and you can measure it, you can estimate it, look like doing experiments with tactile predators and fish predators. And generally you find that fish, if there is enough light, fish are much more efficient 
in feeding, using your eyes to catch something is extremely efficient uh, <laughs> way of uh, uh, predating uh, zooplankton, catching zooplankton. While tactile predators are not so efficient. At least when there is enough light. Okay, now that's a primer for the Baltic. <laughs> now we can get, now we can go to try and, and bring these things together a little bit. So you, I've, I've already I mentioned this uh, th th this thing about um, um, coexistence. Huh? You can you can have you can have a coexistence by being having different specialists being niche diversification right? so if, you, if there, there's a difference in exactly the resource that organisms use they can coexist or they can coexist if there is some predator killing the winner this is the basic ecological hypothesis i mentioned earlier <laughs> okay and here is um is the uh, basic structure of uh what is being, we like to call the killing the winner structure model um, for the the Baltic system as we as in this particular way of, of looking at things. So you have a a productivity of zooplankton which generates a biomass of zooplankton set, and this productivity is assumed to be proportional to primary production. It's, it's assumed that a certain fraction of the primary production turns into uh, zooplankton. Uh, and then this zooplankton is eaten by jellyfish or by fish. And this, how much is, is actually transported from zooplankton to, to sprat and herring is a function of the, the yield just a co coefficient turning zooplankton biomass into sprat biomass times uh, the search efficiency, huh? the, the, the attack rate or the clearance rate, this parameter I talked about in the beginning, key ecological factor. And the same here for jellyfish. Uh, and then sprat can be eaten by cod, which has the same type of, uh, of process formulation here, it's there is a yield of, and there is a, a, an attack rate or a search efficiency, and there is a fishing mortality on this one. Here there's a, just a, a natural background death mortality. Do you mean mainly jellyfish are Because there's not so many other species that are permanently abundant. Yeah, they, they have, they have um, parameterized the model with a mixture of Aurelia, which is the biggest one. And then also CNA is, I think that's added together. Yeah, but they took some data. But they took some data available what what the biomasses of those are, and I don't know if they I can't remember if they added any of the other uh, xenophores or something. But, but this is a this is a simple structure. I mean, do you are you following? Following this is this is quite simple. It's a biomass model. You have a production in the bottom, you have loss terms, and you have four compartments. So it's 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 a uh, relatively simple. Uh, <clears throat> now, in this trait-based perspective, this would be a com competition specialist, and this would be a defense specialist because it has no natural predators. So there's very few turtles around <laughs> in most places here. Um, yeah, and so there's mortality and uh, and uh, including fishing, and this is related to the productivity, which is then exactly the the, the, the more eutrophicate, eutrophicated and the fjord, the, the fjord, <laughs> the Baltic fjord is <laughs> <laughs> the more zooplankton is produced. Huh? Okay, uh, now. Put into a simple differential equation, this is a, this is a, still a rather simple system. Huh? This is like a lot Voltaire model with uh, four four parts elements in it. So you have the production system, then the loss terms. So then so this is just how much is eaten of by the jellyfish, 
and how much uh, is lost. So this is this is this is uh, understandable, isn't it? Yeah. And what you can do, what what uh, what what you can do here is to say, okay, one is we can assume, okay, what when is this a stable system? Equilibrium. What's the equilibrium condition in this system? Anybody know how how we do that? You want to find uh, you can you could you could run it in a computer and you would end up with a stable system, but you could also just solve this analytically to find uh, equilibrium conditions. The changes so equal to zero. Yeah, exactly right. So you put all of these equal to zero, and then you have a, you can you can sort of sort it out, and and you end up with. An equilibrium solution here. Huh? So that's the. This is the equilibrium zooplankton abundance, e equilibrium jellyfish abundance. You just put all of it equal to zero and solve it. Fish, forage fish, and and cod, and, and cod uh, equilibrium. So you have a, a simple, rather simple set of parameters here that you can vary, and you can see what happens uh, in 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 equilibrium. Okay. Um, now, if you if you if you again take this one and put that equal to zero, that's exactly the uh, and solve it for for uh, um, zooplankton production. So you, you you put this equal to zero, do the algebra, and you end up with an equation like this. And that this is this is the zooplankton production needed. For jellyfish to to exist in the system, to enter the system. So if production is lower than that, they will, they will, they will, there's no room for jellyfish in the system. And you can see here that the, the higher the efficiency of the fish, uh, the higher the production needs to be. Huh? And the higher the efficiency of cod and the efficiency of jellyfish is, the lower the production needs to be. Are you following? So there is a sort of an, a productivity level where uh, jellyfish can enter the system. Below that productivity, and there is no uh, jellyfish. Okay. Now, so if you if you if you if you solve this equilibrium for increasing levels of eutrophication. Then this is what uh, you get, the, where the different compartments of the model will end up in uh, in equilibrium. So there is a at very low uh, eutrophication level, low productivity. It's the zooplankton that will increase up to a certain level, where there is enough zooplankton for the forage fish, the spratton herring, to establish. And all in that region, all the extra productivity will go into sprat and herring. Yeah? There will be so there will be this sort of flat development of the of the zooplankton uh, up to that a certain level, and then there's a certain level where there will be er enough sprat and herring for cod to establish, and then for a while the energy will be the extra productivity in the system will be split among cod and zooplankton. Yeah? Are you following yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then there is a certain point where jellyfish will come into the system and all the extra energy will, will just, uh, all the extra productivity will just be flowing into the uh, jellyfish. That's the that's the that's that's the basic simple simplest uh, version of this model. Now, <coughs> but <laughs> we know that eutrophication <laughs> adds to uh, the processes of the the foraging efficiency of the cod and the foraging efficiency of the uh, of the sprats and herring. So you can you can use these data here. To sort of say something about the 
habitat volume for sprat and herring and cod. Um, so, so th then you can um, say that, okay, an increased degree of eutrophication changes the habitat size of sprat and herring and the habitat size of uh, the cod. And you can use those secchi depth measurements to get exactly the, how that total <coughs> volume of the Baltic is compressed for fish, uh, both cod and, and herring. And you can add that into that model. You can do the same analysis, but to that foraging efficiency is constrained by the extra uh, eutrophication. Okay, yeah, so assuming that this habitat is proportional to K, there, there's a bit of a discussion about that in the, uh, in the, in the, in the paper. So there's two effects of eutrophication. It increases the total productivity, but it constrains the feeding efficiency of cod and the feeding efficiency of sprat and herring. It has this double effect in the system. And then the whole the model prediction equilibrium shifts to a different um, picture where you have a similar zooplankton increase, and then sprat and herring enters and cod enters, zooplankton increase, but then actually the, 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 the biomass, equilibrium biomass of sprat and herring will uh, decrease over, over uh, with increasing uh, uh, eutrophication levels. <coughs> yeah, so... Um, Because the comp yeah the competitive ability of sprat and herring goes down with increasing turbidity, but jellyfish is not really affected by that. But but so they they become they have a lower search efficiency as eutrophication increases. So um, why do they go so high around situation one, sprat and herring? And yeah, they, mm. Let's see. Um, right they here they go to, to so here they stop mm -hmm. uh, around here uh, yeah they have a steep so they have a steeper in, yeah because of the limitation uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. <laughs> a good point I did not notice that so here, cod comes in at an earlier stage, at least. Huh? Cod enters at an earlier point. <coughs> I'm, I, I'm not able to see if there's really a steeper curve, but maybe it is. But cod may be entering at a lower, later stage and comes up more steeply. I, I'm not sure about those details, but... Um, I just wonder how the spread can be above Mm -hmm. But it's biomass, not production. I know, but compared it's to actually, the other, yeah. compared to the other example, mm -hmm. yeah. it's very often more, much more, more biomass of, of sheep on a productive field, than, depending on the. Yeah, yeah, but I, I thought they should be similar. Should be, but, I know. Yeah, no, I think the, the scale is at least the same, but uh, the level at where this happens, they, they sort of have a bit of more room here, I think, before cod enters. And then, no, but I, I'm not sure that all of these, uh, <laughs> I haven't uh, <laughs> played with it. <laughs> but it's a good point. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and then we have this uh, situation. So there's an optimal sort of eutrophication level. Um, yeah, and this is another way of picturing it. If you just use this, if you seki, turn it into seki depth, so increasing seki depth means uh, less jellyfish, more sprats, and also more cod and herring until yeah, a point where 
a cod actually is outcompeted. Now a cod cod yeah, because zooplankton disappears when there's productivity, dis you know, the productivity goes down here. It, that's what happens here, of course. Production yeah, becomes to. Hmm? Uh, yeah, exactly that. That's. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just, just uh, I, I'll show you a, a figure of that as well. There is a, an exactly, I mean, this is, this sort of turns it into the Black Sea argument here that increasing. Secchi depth would lead to more more fish. So I mean that fits nicely with that particular increase that you see from this model. Uh, let me see. Okay, the, the, that figure of where we are today isn't here. But in, if you look in the paper, I think one of these arrows is saying something about where we are today. <laughs> I think it's this one. <laughs> um, and then, and, and uh, there, are, I have seen a figure where, where, where it's actually showing. So there's something like this. I can't remember exactly. We move from here to here or something. So we're quite close to the yellowfish takes over. <laughs> well, here this is a continuous change here, but the, but increasing the decreasing water clarity would mainly affect the cod here, and of course also. Uh, both sprat and herring and cod, so it is becoming less productive in this system. Yeah, so that's uh, that's essentially the, the what this model uh, is uh, leading to. Worry. No, 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 no. no. Can we see the summaries? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So this is yeah this is a like a strong single type force. You have an if you have an increased freshwater runoff, increased uh, because freshwater often carries all these uh, yellow colored st uh, substances from land. It also affects the. Uh, but I, I like this model. It's, it's like a simple exercise on. You can play with parameters, and it's very nicely parameterized. If you if you look at it, they're careful in, in putting uh, values in there. They also tried to put in some values from earlier times, where there were uh, much less jellyfishes actually in the in the some of the observations. And it's so simple; you can make it yourself. You can, you can sit down and build a computer program and play with it. 